Hello everyone. I am super excited to be here today and to talk to you about edge caching GraphQL APIs. My name is Max Stoiber. I am in beautiful Vienna, Austria here. Unfortunately, I can't be there in person this time, but I am really excited to be here. And if you want to follow me practically anywhere on the internet, I am at MXSTBR basically everywhere. I am the co-founder of Graph CDN, which is the GraphQL CDN. If you are in the React community, in the React.js community, or in the JavaScript community more generally, you might have used some of the open source projects that I helped build, like Styled Components, or React Boilerplate, or Microanalytics, or a whole bunch of others. I'm really active in that scene, and so if you're there, you might have uh, used some of those projects uh, as well. The story of GraphCDN and how we got there started in 2018. At the time, I was the CTO of another startup called Spectrum. And at Spectrum, we were building a modern take on the classic community forum. So essentially, we were trying to combine the best of what PHP BB gave us 20 years ago with the best of what Discord and Slack give us nowadays. That was essentially the idea. It was a public forum, but all of the comments on any posts were real-time chat. So we tried to take these two worlds that were that are currently very separate, where communities in Slack and Discord write lots of messages, but none of them are findable, and make them public and a little bit more organized so that you could find them afterwards on Google or elsewhere. We tried to combine those two worlds together. Now, that actually worked out surprisingly well, which led to quite a bit of user growth. As you can imagine, with all of this user-generated content, lots of people found us on Google and elsewhere and started visiting Spectrum quite regularly. That meant we had quite a bit of growth. Now, unfortunately, I had chosen a database that wasn't very well supported. I had chosen RethinkDB, which nowadays doesn't even exist anymore. The company behind it shut down after a while. Um, and I'd chosen that database originally because they advertised themselves as the real-time database. And their key feature or their the, the thing they praised externally was that you could put this changes key at the end of any database query and it would give stream real-time updates to that database query to you. And so you could listen to changes to practically any data changes, which felt like a fantastic th fit for what we were trying to do. Because obviously, almost anything in Spectrum was real time, right? The posts popped in in real time, the chat was real time, of course, we had direct messages, which had to be real time. So this felt like a great fit for what we were trying to do. Lesson learned in hindsight, rely on the databases that everybody uses. There's a reason everybody uses Postgres and MySQL and now Mongo. There's a reason those databases are as prevalent as they are and it's because they work. I didn't, I'm, I'm a lot wiser now. I wasn't that wise back then. And so it very quickly turned out that RethinkDB, the real time nature of it didn't scale at all. We had hundreds of thousands of users every single month but RethinkDB couldn't even handle a hundred concurrent change listeners. Now, as you can imagine, every person that visits the website starts many different change listeners, right? We're listening to changes at, of the specific post that they're looking at. We're listening to changes of the community that the post is posted in. We're listening to new notifications. We had a bunch of listeners per user. And essentially, our database servers were on fire literally on fire. Oh, thankfully, not literally, but they were crashing quite frequently. I googled servers on fire and found this amazing stock photo of servers on fire, which if your data center looks like this, you have some really serious problems. Ours weren't quite as bad, but they were still pretty bad. So we had this database that didn't scale and we had, essentially, we had to work around that limitation. We wanted to switch to a more well-supported database. However, that's a lot of work. 
um, rewriting the hundreds of database queries we'd written and optimized up to that point, migrating all of that data without any downtime. That was just a whole project and we wanted to get there eventually, but we needed a solution for us crashing literally every day right at this moment. As I was thinking about this, of course, I realized that caching, we had an ideal use case for caching because our API was really read heavy. Of course, it's public data. Lots of people read it, but not as many people write to it. And so actually we had an ideal use case for caching. We'd originally chosen GraphQL for our API because we had a lot of relational data. We were fetching a community, all the posts within that community, the authors of every post, the number of comments, a bunch of relational data. And GraphQL was a fantastic fit for that use case. It worked out extremely well for us. And we really enjoyed our experience of building our API with GraphQL. The one big downside that we ran into was that there weren't any pre-built solutions for caching GraphQL at the edge, which is what we wanted to do. Now, we wanted to essentially run code in many, many data centers all around the world, and we wanted to route our users to the nearest data center and cache their data very close to them for a very fast response time, but also so that we could reduce the load on our servers. Now, if you've ever used GraphQL, then you know that that is essentially what GraphQL clients do in the browser. If you've heard of Apollo Client, Relay, Urkel, all of these GraphQL clients, what they are is essentially an, a, a, a fetching mechanism for GraphQL queries that very intelligently caches them in the browser for a better user experience. So in my head, basically, the question I wanted to answer was, can't I just run a GraphQL client at the edge? GraphQL clients do this in the browser. Why can't I just take this GraphQL client that's running on my local browser, put it on a server somewhere, and have that same caching logic, but at the edge? To answer that question, I want to dive a little bit into how GraphQL clients cache. If we look at this example of a GraphQL query, which fetches a blog post by a slug, and it fetches its ID, title, and the author, and of the author, it fetches the ID, name, and avatar. And there is one magic trick that makes GraphQL caching really great. And that is the underscore underscore type name meta field. You can add that to any GraphQL object. Any, in, in your query, you can add that to any object type and you will get back the name of the type of the response. So for example, with this query, we would add type name in these two places for the post and also for the author. When the origin responds with the data, the response will look something like this. With the important piece being that now we have the post data and we know that the type that was returned there was a post. And the same thing for the author. We got the author data and we also know that the author is a user. And when we take this response and we store it in our cache locally in the browser, we can now associate that cached query response with those two objects. We can tag it with post with the ID five and user with the ID one. Okay, that's fine. So we've just taken this query response, we've put it in the cache, we key that by the query that we saw, so by the get post query. And anytime we see the same query, we return that same data. Why are these tags relevant? Why do I care that this contains the post with the ID five and the user with the ID one? Well, this is where the magic comes in. GraphQL also has something called mutations, which are essentially just actions. Anything that changes data needs to be a mutation. For example, if we had a mutation that was called edit post, which edits a post. In this case, we're editing the post with the ID five and changing its title. Any mutation also has to fetch whatever it changed. So in this case, we're getting back the post. And again, we can do the same thing we did for the query and add the underscore underscore type name field to the response. Now, when that response comes back from the origin to our client, the client can look at this response and go, oh, look, we just sent a mutation to the origin. That mutation has come back from the origin and the data that was returned was the post with the ID five. Ha. Huh. I actually have a cached query response that contains that post with the ID five. And I can now automatically invalidate that cached query result that contains the stale data of this post. That's amazing, right? And this is what GraphQL clients do under the hood. They do this magic invalidation based on the underscore underscore type name field and the ID field. And then they combine them to invalidate any stale data that has been changed 
at the origin. There's one slight edge case here where the magic kind of ends, which is list invalidation. If you imagine a query that fetches a list of blog posts, in this case, just their ID and title, when we look at the response to, to this query, it's an array that just contains the one blog post that we have right now, the post with the ID 5, how to edge cache GraphQL APIs. Now, a mutation that creates a new post now poses an interesting problem because, of course, the response to this create post mutation will look something like this. It will return an object of a post with the ID 6. But, of course, our, quest query, our cached query result for the post list doesn't contain the post with the ID 6. And that's really annoying because that means that GraphQL clients can't automatically invalidate when lists, when new items are created. Kind of frustrating. Now, thankfully, they found a good workaround for this, which is manual invalidation. Essentially, GraphQL clients give you different APIs to manually influence the cache and change it depending on which things pass through it. So for example, with Urkel, which is uh, the third biggest GraphQL client, this would, look, this would look a little bit like this. You could tell Urkel that when the create post mutation passes through the GraphQL client, invalidate any query, cached query result that contains the posts query, that contains the list of posts. And so that way we can automatically invalidate that, no problem. And whenever a post is created, our GraphQL client will automatically refetch the fresh data from the origin. GraphQL clients actually go one step further and they do something called normalized caching. If we go back to our original query of fetching a single blog post, it's a D title and it's author, then rather than taking the entire response of the post with the D5 and the user with the D1 and putting that entire thing keyed by the query into the cache, they actually take each object within the query response individually and store that individually. So inside of Urkel's cache, this looks a little bit like this, where we essentially in the cache store, okay, the post with the ID 5 corresponds to this data, and the user with the ID 1 corresponds to this other data. Why do we care to do this? Because now, if, if a query comes in that, for example, fetches the user with the ID 1, then the cache can go, oh, hold on, you're fetching the user with the ID 1. Although we haven't seen the specific query before, we do actually have that specific data in our cache and we can just serve you that on the client without you having to go to the origin to fetch that data again because we've already fetched it. It was just deeply nested in some other query, but we've normalized that for you and can now give you the user data for the user with the ID 1. No problem, just like that which is very nice and actually makes for less network traffic and a much nicer user experience because things will resolve much, much faster since they're already on the client and loaded. Very nice. You essentially only ever fetch every object once, which is fantastic as people, particularly if people navigate around your app quite frequently. Now, the one thing that's missing here that you might have noticed is the post.author. We have the post with the ID 5 data and the user with the ID 1 data, but how do we know that the post author is the user with the ID 1? Well, Urkel stores that in a separate data structure that looks like this, which essentially just talks about the relations or the links between things. So here we're essentially saying, hey, if you're fetching the post with this specific slug, that corresponds to the post with the ID 5. If you're fetching the post with the ID 5's author, then that corresponds to the user with the ID 1. And then the user with the ID 1 doesn't have any further relations or links that you can go into. Now, what I really want you to take away from this section is that GraphQL is actually awesome for caching. It's actually really, really good for caching because of its introspectability. It tells you what data you're returning. And this introspectability combined with a strict schema where you have to return something that matches that schema means it's actually really good for caching. And that's also a lot of the reason why so much great tooling has spun up around GraphQL. It's gotten such wide community adoption that if one person builds tooling, tooling for it, it, because it's always the same GraphQL spec that it, that it has to follow, everybody else gets to benefit from that tooling. And that's incredibly powerful. Now, to get back to my original question that I posed way back in 2018, can't I just run a GraphQL client at the edge? Can't I just take this logic that 
Apollo client relay and Urkel have internally anyway. Take that same code and just put it on a bunch of servers around the world at the edge so that everybody that uses Spectrum everywhere gets super fast response times and we get to reduce the load our server has to handle massively. Well, the key to the answer of this question lies in the last part, the edge. Because as it turns out, GraphQL clients are designed with very specific constraints that differ, that, that differ ever so slightly from the constraints we would have to work with at the edge. One of the main ones that we have to deal with if we were to deploy caching logic to the edge is authorization. Because, of course, if a GraphQL client runs in the browser, it knows that if something is in the cache, whoever's requesting this again can access it because it's the same person, right? If I'm using Spectrum and I'm querying for the post with the ID5 the, and the GraphQL client puts that in the cache, then the GraphQL client doesn't have to worry about authorization. It doesn't even have to know anything about authorization because I am allowed to access the post with the ID5. So if I request the same post again, the client can just give that to me from the cache, right? And go, yeah, of course, right? No problem. At the edge, that's slightly differently, right? If we have one server sitting that a lot of users are requesting data from, some of those might be allowed to access the post with the ID5, but others maybe aren't, right? Or maybe even more specifically, if you think about user data, right? Maybe somebody's allowed to access their own email, but nobody else is. And so we can't just take a query and put that result in the cache because that would mean everyone gets served the same data. So if somebody queries some data that's sensitive, that's specific to that user, suddenly that would be served to everyone. That would be a nightmare, right? That would be a terrible security nightmare and a really bad experience because we would essentially just be leaking data. Very bad idea. So at the edge, what we have to do is, rather than just making the cache key a hash of the query, so essentially we take the query text that we have and the variables, and we use that as a cache key, rather than doing just that, we also have to take the author authorization token into account. Whether that's sent via the authorization header or whether that is a cookie, we have to just add that to the cache key so that if somebody else sends the same query, they don't get the same response. It's as simple as that. Just put the authorization token in the cat, excuse me, in the cache key, and everything will be fine. The other part that's a little bit different is cache purging, because not only do we have to do automatic cache purging and support manual invalidation for list invalidation, we also have to do it globally, right? If you're running at the edge in all of these data centers globally, then you have to invalidate that data globally, right? If the post with the ID5 changes and the user sends a mutation to edit that, or the server says, hey, look, this has changed and wants to manually invalidate it, then you have to do it globally. You can't just do it in one data center. That would be a terrible experience because it, the, the stale data would stick around in every other data center. You have to do it globally. And so as we were thinking about these problems for GraphCity and as we were building out this GraphQL edge cache solution, we came to the conclusion that we're, that we're going to use Fastly's Compute at Edge product. Now, we are huge fans of Fastly here. And the reason we chose Fastly is because, like their name suggests, they are super fast. Fastly has about 60 and ever-increasing data centers worldwide spread across the entire globe. Now, here is a crazy fact. Fastly's invalidation logic, right? If you take a query response and you put it into Fastly's cache and you tag it with the post with the ID5, if you then send an API request to Fastly to invalidate any cache query result that contains the post with the ID5, they can invalidate stale data within 150 milliseconds globally. 150 milliseconds globally. That is probably faster than you can blink, right? In the time that it takes me to do this, Fastly has already invalidated the data globally. That is absolutely mind-blowing to me, right? And I actually looked up a while ago, I was like, wait, hold on. How fast even is the speed of light, right? Surely that takes a while to go around the globe once. And so I looked it up and actually light does take 133 milliseconds, if I remember correctly, to get across the entire globe. So how can fast invalidate within 150 milliseconds? That is super fast. Well, the answer is, of course, that, they're, that they don't have to go around the entire globe because they're going bi-directional. They're going both ways at the same time. So they only have to go around half the globe. 
which cuts the time in half. And then, of course, they also do. Like, they have a really fancy gossiping algorithm, which you can Google. They've wrote. They've written some great articles about it, and um, I, I bow down in front of their engineers because it's absolutely genius, and it is so fast that it enables our customers now to cache a lot more data. Right? If you can invalidate stale data within 150 milliseconds globally, imagine how much more data you can cache because. It will never be stale, right? When the data changes, send an API request and 150 milliseconds later, everybody globally has the fresh data. Imagine how much more data you can cache if you have the super fast invalidation. And that's the reason we use Fastly. They're super fast and we're super happy with them. So that's essentially what GraphCDN is. We rebuilt this caching logic to run at the edge, to take authorization into account, and to have this global cache purging. And we deploy it to Fastly's computed edge 60 worldwide data centers to allow our customers to cache their GraphQL queries and their GraphQL um, uh, responses at the edge. I wish this would have existed back in 2018 when we had our scaling problems with Spectrum. At the time, I just built a terrible in-memory caching solution that reduced the load slightly until we eventually got acquired by GitHub. And I just, if we had had GraphCity and we would have been able to scale so much more smoothly, we would have saved so much money because, of course, running something at the edge is much cheaper than running the request through our entire infrastructure. And it would have been a much better experience for all of our global user base because everybody would have had super fast response times from their local data center. All right. I hope you learned about GraphQL caching today. The main thing I want you to take away is GraphQL is amazing for caching. That's really the takeaway I want to hone in on. GraphQL, absolutely fantastic for caching. The introspectability, the strict schema, mwah, chef kiss. Just absolutely fantastic. And if you have a GraphQL API, I'd love to meet you. I'd love to hear what else we can do for you in the future, even if you don't need caching. Thank you for having me. If you have any questions, feel free to hit me up anytime. I am at MXSDPR practically everywhere on the internet, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks a lot for uh, preparing the presentation uh, for this track. Definitely uh, excited to hear about the technology and ability to uh, CDN cache the GraphQL APIs. I also love the energy of the presentation. It's just like uh, there's a lot of drive behind your, uh, behind your talk. Uh, and hopefully you, are, you have saved a little bit for the live Q&A. Uh, I know it's, uh, it's getting late uh, in Austria. But yeah, let's, uh, let's plan the, the, next 20, 20, uh, the next 20 minutes uh, chatting about like, some of the more uh, nuances about your, uh, your talk, about your technology. And uh, for the audience, yes, I encourage you to ask your questions in the chat. Uh, and uh, uh, Max uh, will, uh, will do his best to, to answer them. Thank you for having me. I just wanted to mention that. And uh, I'm, I hope the, the energy level matched my excitement of uh, being at QCon <laughs> today. I am, yeah. I am pumped to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure, Max. Uh, so yeah, let's... Um, uh, you mentioned a few interesting um, technical details, uh, but before we go into those, um, can you share some of the success stories, some of the real world numbers of, uh, from the actual APIs in production that you, you currently manage and help to cache. What are the real world numbers and if you can share any specific examples in what domains those uh, numbers are from? Oh, of course. Um, actually, in fact, I'm going to look up to make sure that I say the exact correct numbers. Um, one of our customers, one of our recent customers is Italic.com, which is an e-commerce retailer and they pride themselves on selling really high quality stuff that is completely unbranded. So there's no Italic logo on anything. It's all completely unbranded and they do it in the same um, factories and at the same manufacturers that other big brands are working on. So you can buy like a Prada bag without the Prada logo for much cheaper is sort of the, the point of Italic. And they're really worried about Black Friday coming up. They had huge traffic they had a huge traffic spike last year and they really couldn't scale. They, their server was apparently crashed every few hours. And so about a month or two ago, they started thinking ahead again, okay, Black Friday is coming up. How can we solve this problem this year round? And they added GraphCD into the stack in front of their GraphQL API. And I'm reading this out because I want to make sure that I get the numbers right. It reduced their overall server load by 61%, database load by two orders of magnitude and page load times by over one second. 
Um, and that's just one of the most recent ones that I, that I know off the top of my head um, who've been really, really successful with Graph And we're actually seeing um, a lot more e-commerce companies signing up and putting us in front of their Graph Kill APIs because for them, one of them actually told us this, this wasn't Italic, but another customer, they, they said in a, in a customer call, milliseconds mean money, right? And for, for e-commerce, while they're not latency critical, they're very light latency sensitive, right? And the faster they can render the web pages, the faster their APIs are, the more money they will make. Um, that's a very strong correlation there. And so to them, our product really helps scale, but also make more money ultimately because we can really reduce the page load times um, across the globe. Yeah, actually, I think it was Amazon back in 2009, if I recall correctly, who did the first uh, one of the first studies and mentioned uh, some of the impressive numbers of uh, matching the milliseconds delay on the e-commerce side to the revenue that they would uh, generate in, uh, yeah. for, for, for shopping. So definitely not surprised to see more e-commerce retailers jumping on, on, on board. There's a few studies like that. Walmart has done famously some. Staples, I think, has done some. Nike has done some. Um, and practically everywhere the outcome is, the faster your website is, the more money you make, right? And there's like a there's like a spike. I was recently talking with one of our other customers, and and there's there's like a spike, right? Like if you if you get faster from like 20 seconds to 10 seconds, it's not gonna matter that much, right? Like you're still so slow that dude, your conversion drop off will just be massive. But if you if you can get from 10 or even five seconds down to three to one seconds, right? That's a huge difference. Yeah. Um, and we really enable our customers to get to speeds even faster than that globally, everywhere around the world, even though they usually only have their data centers in Virginia most of the time, right? A single data center in US East is sort of the standard setup that we see there. And so that's really exciting for us because ultimately they enable us and hopefully they make a lot more money than they would ever have to pay us. Off of yeah, the back yeah. of the performance improvements, which is quite definitely amazing. makes sense. So yeah, let's dive a little bit more into the technical details. Uh, so you mentioned that um, uh, authentication uh, uh, is generally a challenge when you put the data from the client to the shared infrastructure, like a CDN edge. Um, yeah. And the, probably two questions. Like first is uh, how do you generally define and what the recommendations you provide to the API authors, like to categorize the APIs as authorized or uh, generically shared? Uh, and uh, can you generally uh, share any more details uh, into the internals of how it works? Absolutely. So what's interesting about GraphQL APIs is that certain types of fields might be authenticated, but others really aren't, right? Maybe a blog post type is publicly available and every if the data is the same for everyone. But then you might have a current user query that fetches the currently authenticated user. And that obviously has to be specific to the authentication token that is present in the request. Um, and essentially, we as GraphCDM, but I think every solution should do this, allows you to specify, OK, the current user, for example, that's an authenticated query. If that's in the query, then please cache this entire result that you've just gotten from the origin and cache it for every user separately so that we don't share that data. And then um, Corollarily, if only a blog post is in the query, then please cache it publicly, right? Please make sure that if only the blog post is in there, just cache it the same for everyone, no matter if they're authenticated or not. Now, that actually, that configuration aspect of it, of saying, okay, which fields and which types are specific to a user versus public, actually has interesting implications down the line because you, with GraphQL, you can query for many of these fields at the same time, right? You can query for a blog post and the current user at the same time. And so actually a lot of what our customers end up doing right now is they manually end up sending two requests to increase their cache rate. Because otherwise, if you send both of these queries in the same HTTP request, then you'll end up with a very low cache rate on the blog post and unnecessarily so because it, you could have almost probably a 100% cache rate on that, right? Because suddenly every cache response has to be scoped to the user because it also contains the current user. So at the moment, our customers manually end up splitting these usually into two HTTP requests and sending authenticated requests separately from public requests. However, that's also something really interesting that we're thinking about because we at the edge, we can, we can, we can look at your configuration and we can go, hold on, the current user is specific to the user, right? And the blog post is public. So why don't we just split them automatically, right? Like we can just go in and say, hey, look, we know that this part of the GraphQL tree is specific to the current user. This part is public. We're just going to split them at the edge into two HTTP requests so you don't even have to worry about it. And it's sort of an under the hood optimization from us to make sure that you're getting the highest cache rate possible. Um, so that's something we're thinking about. We've so far been very 
conservative in messing with people's GraphQL queries because that's where the danger lies. So far, we try to stay as dumb as possible, right? We just take the entire query, we cache the entire query, no magic, nothing can go wrong, right? Like it just works. And now we're with the feedback from our customers, we're starting to figure out, okay, where are the areas and what are sort of the features that we can provide now that we have this sort of safe way of doing things and where can we make it slightly less safe, but maybe get you a much higher cash rate rate in return. And that is definitely one of the areas that we're very much thinking about. Yeah, but one question. So you mentioned that uh, you were asked the users to specify which is a public and which is a, a private API. Uh, how is it declared? Uh, what sort of uh, information that, uh, that is it standard uh, or is it something that's specific to your product or is it something that uh, could become like the part of the GraphQL spec? So there's two different ways you can specify this. Um, the default way is that we have sort of a concept of um, rules, which is very similar to if you know Cloudflare page rules. I think Sergey just, Sergey, are you back? I, I'm back, sorry. I had a hardware issue. <laughs> yeah, you're all good, you're all good. Uh, I was just saying, we, we have the concept of rules, which is very similar to if you use Cloudflare before they have page rules, um, where essentially you can define rules and say, if the query contains this type of field, then set the cache configuration to that. Right, um, And so you can create as many rules as you want and you can be like, okay, if it contains the current user, it's authenticated. If it contains the blog post, it's public and cache it for a year or whatever, right? Like you can set any kind of configuration that way. The, so that's specific to our product. The other way you can do it is that we have, um, we respect the origin cache control header. And that's a setting you can enable or disable as well. But many, particularly in the Node.js ecosystem, many GraphQL servers come with the ability to add annotations for caching, uh, for, for, for cache control to types and fields in your GraphQL schema. So in your GraphQL schema, you can add things like the add cache control directive and say add cache control max h900. And the GraphQL server then goes through the query, figures out what are the, all the directives that are in there in the schema for all the types and fields in that query and computes the cache control header out of that and sends that back through to the response. And now we as GraphQL, and we can look at that header and we can go, okay, you told us we should cache this for 900 seconds, so we're going to cache it for 900 seconds. Um, so we also support that as a sort of um, enhancement. Now, depending on your GraphQL server implementation, that doesn't quite have the same flexibility as our rule structure, hence why we added the rule structure, because we were like, okay, some people are going to need more power than this. Um, but we also support essentially just a standard cache control header sent back from your origin, depending on uh, what the query contains or doesn't contain. All right. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, thanks for the detailed answer. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, another question about the internals. Uh, I guess you you mentioned how you invalidate the data, and you talked about relationships be between the objects. Uh, how do you invalidate the relationships? Is it uh, does it work similarly, or there are there any nuances? That's actually a great question. So what we do is we essentially walk through the entire response, right? So we take whatever you send back from the origin that contains the blog post, the author, maybe all of the comments and their authors, and we figure out which objects are in this response, right? So that might be a blog post, a user that is the author, um, a comment, and then the author of the comment might be another user. And we tag the cached response with every single one of the objects that we see in the data. And then you can essentially ping us and say, hey, look, the user with the ID 5 has changed, and we can go through and we can invalidate any cache query result that contains that specific object, that specific user, if that makes sense. And so that's how we don't even really have to be aware of relations, right? Those are still defined in your GraphQL schema and with your GraphQL queries, but we can still invalidate them because you have to send them back through the response. OK, yeah, makes sense. Thanks a lot. Uh, and yeah, we have another question from the audience. Uh, what kind of observability tools uh, are needed uh, for the edge caching? And uh, what, uh, what were your findings and learnings that you've integrated into your product? That is actually a really interesting question because that is another thing we're very much thinking about right now. We started out, we realized very early on that now people are passing all of their GraphQL requests through us. We can provide analytics for people, right? And so we added GraphQL analytics to our system where you can essentially see how many requests are you getting? What is your cache rate per time frame? Which queries are you seeing? Which mutations are you seeing? What are their individual performance metrics? P50, P95, P99. What are the individual cache rates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Then we realized, okay, we have all of this data on your queries, but we also have a lot of data on your errors. Because we're in front of your infrastructure, we essentially see every single error that is sent back from your API. And so we added error tracking to our system, right? So we have performance monitoring and we have error tracking where we essentially 
you can very finely configure alerts, right? Very similar to what you might be used to from a Sentry or a Datadog or whatever. And you can say, hey, look, if I see more than 50 GraphQL errors in a minute, if I have a huge spike, probably something's going wrong, right? And I, 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 I should probably be aware of that. And so we can then send you an email. It's like message a page of duty, trigger an incident, whatever you want. And the same thing is true for GraphQL and HTTP errors. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the analytics we provide. Now, <clears throat> as we talk with more and more companies that are using graphics in production, we realized very quickly that caching is pretty scary, right? Adding caching to your stack comes with a lot of inherent risk of maybe the data isn't fresh anymore, right? How do you know what is even in the cache, right? Like how do you know that all of the stuff is fresh? Um, and so that's something we're very much thinking about, right? There, we do solve a big problem for a lot of people and so people are already using us, but there's a lot of risk associated with implementing caching and thus there's also a lot of hesitancy with implementing caching and we've been thinking about ways we could get rid of that so stay tuned for that but we have plans to to work on more caching insights and give you a little bit more um i don't know how to phrase this security i guess uh with your caching that's good uh and yeah probably the um, uh the last question for for today uh what are the cases where in See, edge caching might not be a good idea. You mentioned that uh, authentication is already one uh, headwind, uh, but uh, especially thinking about uh, invalidation and the 150 milliseconds delay, which on one side sounds fast, but on the other side, for use case like transactions, that might not be that fast. Like, are there any more details and like what's your general thinking and guidance on this? It definitely boils down to latency critical things where we're talking about milliseconds or something you can't you can't cache those at the cdn edge that doesn't make any sense um and then it also only makes sense for very read heavy apis i have good friends that work at sentry right the error tracking service and they obviously they get billions of, of, of errors sent to them but only a small percentage of them are ever looked at and so for them, caching doesn't make any sense because their data would change way more frequently than the cache it would ever be. You know what I mean? They would probably have a 0% cache hit rate. And so if you have a very, very write-heavy API, caching is probably not for you. On the other hand, if you have a very read-heavy API that is latency-sensitive, but maybe not latency-critical, I think that's really where GraphCDN comes in or edge caching generally comes in. And this can be a very powerful tool to help you scale, but also make your stack way more performant across the globe. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Max. Um, yeah. Thanks again for the presentation. Uh, I also thanks want to quickly me. mention that Max will also join us for the discussion panel uh, later today. Um, and yeah, thanks a lot, Max, for uh, going uh, with us through the Q and A. Uh, we're going to have another a chance to have more informal discussion with Max uh, in the Zoom Hangout. Uh, so you can see the link in the chat how to join. Um, uh, how to uh, 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 how, how, how to join the discussion. There are also links from the schedule page. Uh, and I see there is one more question. We won't be able to take it right now, but the Hangout is actually a very good opportunity to talk more about it. All right, Max, thank you again. And uh, thank you for having the Hangouts. Me. And uh, see you later at the discussion panel.